Good afternoon. It's Saturday, the 26th of September. I'm Erin Viner, and this is IBA News broadcasting from Jerusalem. Former IDF Chief of Staff Lieutenant General Benny Gantz says that the nuclear deal reached with Tehran has some positive aspects and that Israel should reach out to the Iranian people. Gantz made the comments at a speech at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, where he also said that even though the pact with Tehran could have been better, it has in effect ensured that the rogue state will remain nuclear free for 10 to 15 years. The top military leader also stressed that Israel is ready to deepen intelligence cooperation with the United States. Yes, I do agree that a better deal could have been reached. Uh, I do see the challenge the, the theoretical enrichment rights that the Iranian might have gained out of this is indeed a challenge, especially in, on those areas. But I also see the half full part of the class here. And I see the achievement of keeping away the Iranians for 10, 15 years uh, into the future uh, and postponing their capabilities of having a nuclear capability uh, and with the, with the right price. Now, I'm not naive. I understand who we are dealing with. I understand why the Iranians want to possess nuclear capabilities. I understand that we must look into the future, and I think this is what we need to suggest. And to look, I would look at the deal as, as it is. It's a done deal. And let's look forward. And looking forward, I would definitely uh, promote, for most important, the intel capabilities and the intel cooperation between the entire organizations and country to make sure that we expand as much as we can the known areas versus the unknown areas. And last but not least, I would even dare to say that there is a need to reach out to the Iranian people themselves. And let's turn it into a kind of a honey trap, if you wish, for future times. Now, from what I know, and I think I know, and from what I assess, and I think I have a basis to assess it, I am not worried about the Israeli security situation. We are the strongest country in the world. We know how to take care of ourselves. And this issue is a worldwide issue that inflects the Bab el Mandab and all those sea trails. It infects the region. And then it has to do with us, not the other way around. It's not an Israeli issue, then a regional issue, and then a world challenge. It's the other way around. It's a world challenge. Let the world deal with it. It's a regional challenge. Let's see how the region deals with it. And we will stay strong as we are. As part of his ongoing visit to the United States, Pope Francis addressed the United Nations in New York where he called on world leaders to eliminate atomic weapons and he praised the Iranian nuclear deal saying that it is proof of the potential of political goodwill and of law exercised with sincerity, patience and constancy. The pontiff also underscored the urgency for a nuclear free world in full accordance with the non-proliferation treaty in both letter and spirit. Iranian President Hassan Rouhani says that there may be the possibility of improved relations with the United States if the nuclear accord is fully carried out later this year. He made the comments to a group of editors after arriving in New York for the annual opening of the UN General Assembly. He went on to say that Tehran sees implementation of the deal as an enormous test case, which, if accomplished in good faith, would create an improved atmosphere in which the two sides might possibly build on and achieve further progress. When challenged about routine chants of death to America during weekly prayers and rallies in his nation, Rouhani said such calls are not intended to advocate hostility to the American people nor the destruction of the United States, but simply serve as an expression of just how deep the public's opposition to Washington's policies reach. After being asked about the possible release of Washington Post journalist Jason Rezian, after a year in Iranian detention, Rouhani replied that while he favors the freeing of all American prisoners being held in his nation's jails, as well as all Iranian nationals incarcerated in the U.S., the matter is primarily in the hands of the judiciary. 
Here at home, the next commissioner of police is on track for being approved after Attorney General Jutta Weinstein announced that there is no reason to block the appointment of Raish, so far identified only by the Hebrew letter for R, because he is currently serving as the deputy chief of the Shimbet Security Service. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu praised the decision by Public Security Minister Gilad Erdan to appoint Resh, saying that he is a man of many proven accomplishments who has contributed to the security of the state. The cabinet will next hold a teleconference to approve the appointment in the coming days so that it can then be forwarded to the Turco Committee, which must approve all senior civil service positions. Because the candidate is already active in that sector, his vetting process is expected to be relatively swift. What is so far known about Raish is that he is the 52-year-old father of seven who lives in the center of the country and has served in the Shin Bet for the past 28 years, including serving in four of the agency's top positions. His appointment was announced after Erdogan retracted his first recommendation of former IDF Commander Gal Hirsch. The IDF issued a statement today saying that the two soldiers who assaulted two foreign journalists during a Palestinian protest in the West Bank yesterday behaved in an unauthorized manner and will face disciplinary measures. The troops were filmed seizing and destroying equipment belonging to the AFP journalists, one of whom claims that he was jabbed in the side with a weapon after being thrown to the ground. The reporters say that they were covering clashes between Palestinians and security forces when some of the soldiers pulled them aside, cursed at them, and ordered them to stop recording. The Army has confirmed that the highest levels of command are aware of the incident and that the troops will be reprimanded. Residents of Moshav Zanoach near Beit Shemesh are in mourning today after a five-year-old child died and his five-year-old cousin was left in serious condition when the two accidentally locked themselves inside of a car where they were playing yesterday afternoon. Officials say that both boys were discovered unconscious when the family went looking for them after not seeing them for over half an hour. Both were evacuated to the Hadassah in Karim Hospital in the capital where one was pronounced deceased. This is the first time this year that a child has died after being locked in a car. There were two such reported deaths last year and five in 2013. The funeral for renowned journalists and one of the founders of the Israel Broadcast Authority, Moti Kirshenbaum, will take place tomorrow at 10 in the morning at the local cemetery near his home in Michmorit. The iconic media personality passed away unexpectedly yesterday morning at the age of 76 after suddenly suffering a heart attack at his home just minutes before he was preparing to go on air for his weekly sports corner on Army Radio. His death came as a shock to many of us here at IBA who knew him personally and very much appreciated his work. Even though he was employed at Channel 10 for the past 13 years as the co-host of a daily current affairs program, London and Kirschenbaum, with prominent journalist Yaron London, the beloved Kirschenbaum said that he always kept a special spot in his heart for Israel television, which he described as his second home. Among his many roles, Kirschenbaum served as the editor of the Mabat Hebrew News Program, as well as the producer of the popular cult satire program, Nikui Rosh, on Channel One. In 1993, he was appointed the head of the IBA, a position that he held on to for four years. During that time, he was also awarded the prestigious Israel Prize for his work in cinema, television, and radio. Kirschenbaum leaves behind his partner, four children, and many grandchildren. In other regional news, France is reportedly cautioning Russia against becoming further embroiled in the Syrian civil war, saying that Moscow could find itself bogged down in a second Afghanistan in a pointed reference to the Soviet army's bloody campaign against the Mujahideen Islamist insurgency in the 1980s that inflicted heavy military losses for the USSR. The London-based al Sharq al-Set Arabic language daily is reporting that the Paris officials say that it is dangerous for Moscow to increase its deployment of military troops that are meant to bolster the Damascus regime of President Bashar al-Assad. They're also said to have voiced backing for the widely held Western assertion that Assad cannot be part of Syria's political future. The additional Russian support to Syria includes 28 combat planes as well as 2,000 military personnel to an air base near the main port city of Latakia. Britain joins France in expressing concern in the wake of Russia's announcement that it will be conducting naval drills in the Mediterranean Sea. And meanwhile, Hezbollah leader Sheikh Hassan Nasrallah is welcoming Russia's military buildup in Syria in support of their common ally. In an interview with his organization's Al Minar television network, the terror boss said that Moscow was forced to take action because of the failure of the U.S. led campaign against the Islamic State. 
In addition to sending the sending of troops and aircraft, Russia's buildup also includes highly advanced weapon systems that Nasrallah claims will greatly assist efforts to repel the major dangers threatening Syria and the entire region. Meanwhile, the Kuwaiti Al Rai newspaper is reporting that the Syrian army has given dozens of Soviet era tanks to Hezbollah for use in the battle against its enemies. According to the daily publication, the move comes as Iran, Syria, Hezbollah, and Russia launch joint operations in coordinated efforts aimed at de defeating the Islamic State and other insurgent groups opposed to Assad. Saudi Arabia is facing fresh accusations of neglect in the Hajj disaster that killed more than 700 people and injured at least 800 others. The Thursday stampede was the second tragedy to have occurred during this year's pilgrimage, which is overseen by the kingdom's rulers who base their legitimacy in part on protecting Islam's holiest sites. Shiite Iran is leading the scathing condemnation following its customary policy of highlighting opportunities to undermine its Sunni adversary. According to Iranian President Rouhani, at least 140 Iranians are among the dead, and he went on to suggest that ineptitude by the Saudi authorities involved in organizing the Hajj is to blame. Thousands of demonstrators hit the streets of Tehran and other Iranian cities to protest against the Saudi kingdom and to chant death to the ruling Ibn al-Saud family. The Iranian foreign ministry also summoned us the Saudi envoy for a second time in as many days to hear the Islamic Republic's grievances over the incident. In addition, after the convening of an emergency meeting on the matter by the cabinet, Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei demanded that Riyadh accept responsibility for the tragedy he says was caused by their mismanagement. This week's major victory in the critical Greek elections by Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras and his leftist Syriza party came as a surprise. This according to a Brussels-based political analyst who goes on to explain the ramifications of the unexpected results. Nobody would have thought that Syriza would be that much ahead of uh, the main contest, uh, the conservative Nea Demokratia. Um, what the Greek voters said through that vote is that they have a confidence in Mr. Tsipras, that they want to give him another chance, that they don't want to move back uh, to the old establishment. They believe that um, he, his party, but also very much he, is an agent of change, and um, many, a majority or most Greeks, want that kind of change to happen within their country. At home, it makes uh, the prime minister, it makes uh, Tsipras stronger. Uh, he has a clear mandate. Um, he has made a third victory uh, within this year after the January elections, the referendum in July. Now this new mandate given to him, he has been able to defend the old coalition government, which was one of his main objectives. So at the domestic scene, he is the key political figure. Um, with respect to the relationship to um, EU partners, I don't think that it has that much strengthened his position. Um, the key things have been negotiated in July, August. It is now about implementing most of the things which have been agreed to. But what is important is that there is now a clear majority in the Greek uh, parliament which is in favor of implementing the memorandum of understanding. They're not very fond of it, but they know that it needs to be implemented, and that is important. Annual Researchers' Night was held at universities and science museums across Europe and right here in Israel this past week when the doors were open to the public for meetings with scientists and visits to laboratories. Arut Sheva went to Barlan University to take a look. Today is what we call the Scientists' Night. It's an open event for the general public to come to the university, not for students, but for people who don't usually come to universities. Um, and university researchers and professors demonstrate a whole range of experiments, of laboratories, of research activities, um, in a way we're opening the university to the public and we're showing them what we're doing every day. We're seeing a wonderful event, which is the Night of the Scientists, which takes place uh, at the same time in all uh, the states of Europe and uh, it's supported by the European Union and we see here how uh, many, uh, mainly youngsters but also adults and, uh, and very small kids are exposed to science. For the European Union, Israel in general and Bar Ilan University in particular, 
are a pool of talent, a pool of research and specialist knowledge that they wish to tap on. And therefore, there's a strong will on behalf of the European Commission and other European institutions to cooperate with Barilan. And in, over the past few years, we've established strategic cooperation with a great number of European universities within the framework of European Union projects. So are the youth interested in science or it's just, you know, cool to see all these uh, telepathy programs and all these uh, different interactive stations? Well, there's no contradiction between the two. It's cool to see, but to see the, how, how they are interested. In fact, uh, they're not just interested in seeing the wonders, the magics, the, the phenomena, but they ask questions. They try to explain. They try to understand. And in that sense, uh, you can see that uh, it is not just to, for the attraction, but really to understand. Generally speaking, what can you tell us about the field of uh, science and the academic world in Israel? Well, Israel is a scientific power, that by all means, by all standards, any way that you want to measure. And you can see it here. You can see these youngsters that, that come and ask, and many of them. You'll find uh, years from now, maybe 10 or 20 years from now, uh, in bar -Ilan or other universities, but probably as faculty, as scientists, as people who are leading the, uh, the science of the world. Well, the IBA weather team tells us that we can expect a wonderful start to the week with mostly cloudy skies and another slight drop in temperatures. Here's the forecast to home and abroad over the next 24 hours. for being with us this afternoon. I'll be back tomorrow, same time, same channel. Hope to see you then. I'm Aaron Viner, wishing you a great evening and shalom from Jerusalem. Have a great week.